Uh, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today on how supply chain issues are impacting the mining industry brought to you by Dentons and by Dentons Global Advisors. I'm Robin Long, the national co-lead of the mining group in Canada and partner in our Vancouver office. Our practice is focused on mining, environmental and Aboriginal law. I'm often involved in the purchase and sale of mining rights, mines and mining related equipment. So today our speakers will be discussing global supply chain issues and how these have impacted the flow of natural resources and particularly of metals and minerals. We'll cover the key takeaways from COP27, the recent trends in supply chain issues and what your companies can do to mitigate risk. So joining us today, we have Melissa Estock, principal of the Albright Stone Ridge Group, which is part of Denton's Global Advisors. She leads the firm's sustainability team. In that role, she provides advice and assistance to foundations, nonprofits and corporations on stakeholder engagement, partnership and coalition building, and strategy alignment for local markets. So joining Melissa is Mel Coppolo, Vice President with ASG Sustainability Practice, where she advises corporations, nonprofits, and foundations on sustainability initiatives and strategies. So from the dentist team, we have Jen Poirier, partner in our corporate group in Vancouver. Jen represents companies and investment dealers in a range of corporate transactions, including public offerings, financings, IPOs and stock exchange listings, reverse takeovers and mergers and acquisitions. Rachel Howie is the co-lead of the litigation and dispute resolution group in Canada and co-lead for the national ADR and arbitration groups. Her practice focuses on international and domestic arbitration and litigation, mostly in the energy, mining and natural resources industries. And last but not least, uh, James Langley is a partner in our London UK office. James focuses on international arbitration, including both commercial arbitration and investor state arbitration, as well as commercial litigation and ADR. He has experience in arbitration and litigation, mostly within the energy and mining, retail, telecom, shipping and sports sectors. So now I'll pass it over to Melissa and Mel to start us off. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, I'm Melissa Estock, as Robin said. Happy to be with all of you this morning. Um, Mel and I are here representing Denton's Global Advisors, also known as DGA. And I'll say a few things about DGA in case anyone here is unfamiliar. Uh, we could go to the next slide, please. So DGA exists, it's really a brainchild of Denton's, the law firm, and it exists to provide clients with a full suite of advisory services under one roof. Um, as such, we can work alongside our Denton's colleagues to provide clients with various services um, that sort of extend the capabilities of uh, the lawyers on the ground. For example, we have uh, preeminent public and government affairs capabilities. Um, uh, the foundational member of DGA is Albright Stonebridge Group. You may have heard of that. That's where I sit. Uh, it was founded by Secretary Albright, and um, many of our colleagues are have occupied very high-level positions in government and industry um, and are with us now to share their learnings with others. So that's sort of the basis of the public affairs work that we do. And we also have best-in-class communications experts who can help manage uh, critical moments or, um, better yet, as the Secretary used to say, um, prevent them in the first place. The next slide, please. Um, second slide. Um, this slide is really to list some common moments where companies can benefit from outside support. Um, under the first column, uh, we are most often involved in, in doing e the ESG side of due diligence transactions. In the second column, uh, we most often do the work to manage active ESG reputational issues, uh, which can be an issue in the space that you are all in. The third column, uh, I would highlight that we advise on geopolitical disruption and policy tracking. We have some frameworks that we use to bring in uh, not just current law, but policy changes that are around the corner. Um, and then the next slide, please. This is really, uh, this is my final slide, and it's just to sort of um, say that we believe in embedding sustainability across organizations in order to ensure a return on investment in, in any ESG activities. Um, I would highlight that we 
establish ROI in various ways. One thing that we do is use a technology tool that sort of can measure, uh, uh, benchmark the reputation of a company, um, as well as its competitors. Then we, of course, um, work with our dentist colleagues on, on various interventions and can run the same analysis at a later point in time to track whether or not the invent the interventions have worked and and to change uh, course if necessary. Um, the other thing that I would highlight is our belief in the communications around ESG and the actual practice or the activities of ESG on the ground are really two sides of the same uh, coin. Um, as many companies have discovered in recent years, the public is watching this um, and investors are watching to see whether or not public commitments are backed up by activities on the ground. So, so we do both of those things. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mel um, because she was at COP, the COP meetings on the ground. And uh, we'll just say that it's a super interesting moment in the um, supply chain and mining space. Um, in my career, I think it's it's the time when it is true, it is most true that environmentalists and extractives and uh, it, the extractives have uh, have common cause and collaboration is truly necessary um, given the urgency of the issues around climate change. Um, over to you, Mel. Okay. You could go to the next slide, please. So I did, I, as Melissa said, I had the great privilege to be on the ground in Sharm El Sheikh um, attending this COP. It's the third COP that I've attended. Um, and the presence of business sector and the uh, difference between what uh, conversations are happening formally in the plenary among government and those on the margins are having a widening gap. So I just wanted to share um, three high level takeaways that um, for this group. And the first one is kind of what I just said, that mining nor supply chain sustainability were on the formal agenda for COP27. So they were not on the agreed to agenda. They didn't have a formal moment in time with governments um, and formal delegations within the plenary. Any discussion that got brought up about them were in side events, panel events, um, within the green zone, uh, within this innovation space, but not uh, formally within the agenda. However, there was, amongst those that were there, there was just an unbelievable conversation about this rising demand for clean energy technologies and how this production of minerals, such as lithium, copper, cobalt, could increase by as much as 500% by 2050, if we're going to meet these net zero goals that are out there. So you can imagine the conversations that were happening outside of the formal um, space around how are we going to meet those goals? Where's the R&D? Where's the green technology to go into this? Um, the next issue that was really front and center is that forced labor is emerging as a very hot topic in the space of human rights. And because of that, there is becoming a laser focus on the mining industry. There is a sense that informality, corruption, and this general lack of trust amongst community um, is really plaguing this industry and its supply chain. And that's being considered the norm across um, the mineral space. And this kind of concept is being picked up by organizations like USAID, who are looking at community engagement and development, and this is how the mining industry is viewed. There are concerns about how forced labor and the new US regulations are expected to affect Chinese exports. And of course, this includes the refined mineral resources. And through that, how American supply chains are going to be affected, especially in the tech space. And then also there are those companies that sense this is going on. They understand the issues in their supply chains within the communities, and they're already getting um, a start in approach, approaching mining more holistically, looking at how they can incorporate landscape regeneration and biodiversity into their work. So two quick examples of this is uh, Salmon Gold by Resolve. Um, they have uh, entered into a voluntary partnership to remine historical placer gold mine sites and restore fish habitats using sustainable techniques in Alaska, the Yukon Territory, and British Columbia. 
And Rio Tinto has become a leader in the effort to repurpose brownfield mine sites and converting environmental hazards into assets. I think we're going to see things like this become more and more the norm. Um, the World uh, Glo uh, Gold Association, for example, at an event at COP, mentioned that it is now part of their initial work before they even start mining to engage with communities to find out what do those communities need. Sometimes it's water, sometimes it's solar energy, but engagement with um, communities is an, uh, an initial stage of their work. Lastly, I just want to talk about how um, something that you already know is that mining needs and externalities are location specific and its supply chains are very complex which means it's really going to be hard to create relevant global treaties and standards for the industry. This also means that industry and supply chain are very vulnerable to geopolitical tensions. So looking at this, um, there was lots of conversation about the extraction of certain minerals that are heavily concentrated in certain countries. And in some cases, the refinement process is monopolized as well, but often not in that same country. So country-specific issues like lack of regulation, oversight of and how it affects operations, also then will affect the quality of the supply chain. As an example, 20% of the world's nickel used to come from Russia. So the boycott of the Russian economy, economy has affected the battery supply chain. And now most of that nickel supply is being picked up by China. There was conversation, of course, because of this lack of ability to do global standards, that governments are going to have to figure out a way to cut the proverbial red tape. They're going to need to find ways to accelerate permitting, expand loan authority, um, especially in the critical mineral mining space, but also taking into account environmental health and safety standards are met, um, both for employees and, again, in their communities in the mining site. Um, and lastly, in, in this point, just want to talk about how there's really a look into how private investors in the finance sector will start to not only invest in research and development, the development of clean energy technologies, but also in the operations further up the supply chain, like mining for critical minerals, for chips, and battery production. So I want to turn it over now to my colleagues, uh, Rob, Robin and Jenny, who will share more with you. Okay, thanks so much, Mel. Um, I'm going to be um, moving, talking about uh, supply chain issues in the mining industry. And in, in, in this part of the presentation, Jen and I will be focusing on how those uh, issues interact with and impacting, uh, impacting the mining industry. And so for the past few years, it, it really highlighted the risks inherent to the integrated global supply chain. So starting with the COVID-19 pandemic, breakdowns in the global supply chain began leading to shortages in everything from household goods uh, to medical supplies. And along with the rest of the economy, supply chain issues have also been affecting the mining industry, obviously. I'll move to the uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I thought I'd briefly highlight some of the key factors that have, have impacted the global supply chain of minerals and metals. Uh, one key factor that's obviously affected the supply chain has been the pandemic, which had an immediate impact on the day-to-day -day operations of all sectors of the economy. The mining industry has been uh, in some ways particularly vulnerable to the spread of COVID-19 just due to the nature of the shift work and the workers coming into remote camps from various locations. And at the start of the pandemic, we saw some mine operators close their sites temporarily to prevent the virus from spreading. Um, the pandemic does seem to be coming to an end and there have been fewer full mine shutdowns, but the virus is still impacting um, mining operations in other ways. And, and the rise of the more transmissible variants have led to labor shortages caused by staff illnesses in, in mining nations such as Mexico, Brazil, and Peru have all seen increases in COVID-19 case numbers of, as a result of the variants. And that's led to labor shortages and disruptions in the day-to-day -day, um, mining operations. So another key factor that's affected supply chains has been the impact of Russia's war in Ukraine um, and the implementation of sanctions against Russia to date. So the formal trade sanctions directly impacting the mining industry have been limited to select minerals and metals, such as Canada's prohibition on the import of, of gold from Russia. 
However, sanctions against certain Russian individuals, entities, and banks um, can also impact the flow of minerals from Russia. In addition, the um, perhaps a more significant supply chain issue from the war is the risk that Russia may choose to restrict the export of certain minerals in retaliation for sanctions. And because Russia is a key supplier of many of the world's minerals and metals, a need to find other sources from other nations would impact the available supply. Um, and thirdly, the, the mining industry is increasingly subject to the effects of climate change and the impact of extreme weather events. It's predicted that climate change will increase the frequency of these events and that floods, droughts, heat waves, extreme storms in, in certain parts of the globe will become more prevalent. Uh, mining projects are often located in regions that are prone to extreme weather events. And for example, during the first few months of 2022, heavy rains and flooding caused uh, reduced production of copper and iron ore in Brazil, coal in Australia, platinum in South Africa. So in addition to causing reductions in production, uh, extreme weather has resulted in the loss of infrastructure and even the lives of, of workers involved in the industry. And conversely, the impact of drought in the mining industry is also affecting production in certain countries. Uh, Chile is a key producer of copper and lithium, and as the mining process for these minerals is a water intensive process, often takes place in regions that are currently experiencing drought. And the drought combined with the industry's high consumption of groundwater is leaving local communities without an adequate water supply. And, and this is worrisome because without a uh, social license to operate from local communities, um, the continued production of copper and lithium from these mines may be affected. <coughs> so as extreme weather events become more frequent, we're seeing mining companies uh, continue to invest in upgrades to their infrastructure in order to maintain resiliency against climate change. An example of this is the interest in, in mining companies in constructing uh, desalinization plants in order that their production is not affected. And, and the fourth factor, that's uh, been affecting the global supply of minerals and metals that um, uh, Mel mentioned is the political instability of certain mining regions, which in turn affects the confidence of investors when deciding to invest in projects in those countries. And the DRC, for example, is a top global producer of cobalt. Um, and investors have been raising concerns about the increasing divisions within the ruling party of that country, um, following resignation of, of their vice president in, in January. And, and similarly in Peru, which is the uh, second largest copper producer, it's seen its economic growth trending downwards due to investor concern about political instability, allegations of corruption of its past presidents. And, and without this investment into the development of new projects, the concern is that the production and export of copper from Peru will be affected and this is going to lead to shortages. So a little later on in this presentation, Jen will be discussing uh, the steps certain governments are taking to secure the supply of minerals from alternate regions that are not threatened by um, political instability. So I'm moving on to the uh, second slide. The next slide, please. Perfect. So in addition to those issues that are impacting the global supply of minerals and metals generally, there's also a number of specific factors that are affecting the supply of critical minerals. So it's estimated that the global demand for certain critical minerals will increase by anywhere from 500% to 4,000% by 2050. And so without significant investment in critical minerals and effective supply chain management, we can expect to see a significant gap between the available supply and the demand for critical minerals, both in the medium and in the long term. So the um, precise minerals and metals which are defined as critical do vary from country to country and many countries in Canada, including Canada and the US now publish official critical mineral lists. And these lists are then reviewed and revised periodically to reflect changes in the minerals and metals that fit within the definition. So the most commonly included minerals on these lists are those that are used to produce the batteries needed for clean energy technologies, including lithium, cobalt, copper, and graphite. So in Canada, a critical mineral is defined as one that's essential to Canada's economic security and has a threatened supply. It's required for Canada's transition to a low carbon economy or where Canada is a source of a particular mineral for our partners and allies. So Canada's current critical minerals list was published in 2021 and contains 31 minerals and metals that are defined as critical. This list is reviewed and revised every three years. So I'll move to the uh, next slide, please.
Okay, so out of the 31 minerals and metals defined as critical, Canada intends to focus, um, initially focus on securing the supply and production of lithium, graphite, nickel, cobalt, copper, and, and the rare earth elements. Um, these, these six um, classes of, of critical minerals have been prioritized because they offer opportunities for economic growth and employment along the value chain, as well as support for the manufacturing of clean energy tech, communications technology, and advanced manufacturing. So I'll move to the next slide, please. Okay, so the U.S. also publishes a critical minerals list and revises it at least every three years. The most recent list was published in 2022 and contains 50 metals and minerals that are considered critical. The U.S.'s list focuses on similar factors to those used by Canada and includes those minerals and metals that are essential to the economic or national security of the U.S., the supply chain of which is vulnerable to destruction or serve an essential function in the manufacturing of a product, the absence of which would have significant consequences for the economic or national security of the U.S. So most of the minerals included as critical on, on the United States list are the same as Canada's. The key reason that the United States uh, list is longer is that it also includes the rare earth elements and platinum group elements individually, whereas Canada groups those together under one ent entry. So I'll move to the next slide, please. So uh, talking about why critical minerals are important, as mentioned earlier, critical minerals are of key importance because they're a key component to many clean energy technologies, important to national security, and are expected to be subject um, to a sharp increase in demand. Uh, first, critical minerals are used in the production of a, a variety of clean energy products, and one obvious example of these products are the batteries used to power electric vehicles. The Canadian government has included uh, a transition to electric vehicles as a key component of its climate action plan, and it's mandated that all new uh, light-duty cars and passenger trucks be zero emission by 2035. So in 2021, uh, zero emission vehicles represent just over 5% of the new motor vehicles registered in Canada. So meeting that mandate will require a significant increase in the number of electric vehicles produced and a corresponding increase, obviously, in demand for the minerals and metals used to produce batteries. So uh, another factor highlighting the importance of critical minerals is, is that they're key to national security and certain critical minerals, including silicone, the rare earth elements in cobalt are used in the production of semiconductors for AI, quantum computing, robotics, and advanced wireless networks. And most major defense systems and platforms rely on semiconductors for the performance. So, so consequently, uh, an, a supply shortage of the critical minerals needed for the production of semiconductors could greatly impact uh, national defense capabilities. Um, and, and lastly, uh, because of the importance of critical minerals to national security and their role in the transition to clean energy technologies, the demand for critical minerals is expected to increase sharply, both in the short and the long term. In, in the near term, lithium and copper are expected to be in, in very short supply. It's estimated that an additional investment of $21 million billion US will be needed to finance increased lithium production by 2025. An additional investment of 100 billion US dollars will be needed to bridge the gap in copper supply by 2030. So based on for current forecasts, lithium production uh, will need to quadruple by 2030 to meet the growing demand. In the longer term, the World Bank forecasts that a 500% increase in critical mineral production will be needed by 2050 to supply the clean energy transition and the demand for certain key minerals such as lithium and graphite is expected to increase by up to 4,000%. So we'll now hand it over to Jen to discuss the supply chain risks associated with critical minerals. Thank you, Robin. Um, I will touch on a few things and elaborate a little further on some of the uh, discussion that you had. Um, but what I first wanted to talk about is um, we've heard all the reasons as to why critical minerals are so important to the industry and globally, um, to mining as well as globally across other industries. But what we are also realizing is that with this increased importance to the global economy, increased importance to national security and the clean energy transition, that there are actually a number of risks that can specifically impact the supply chain and availability of these minerals. Um, one of these risks is actually due to limited supply of these minerals globally. 
Um, there's a number of different factors that have contributed to this. Um, there was some suggestion that high exploration costs and limited historical investment in critical minerals projects have factored into the lack of large scale advanced development projects in low risk jurisdictions. And what we mean by that is there's a lack of uh, production ready projects in, in considered uh, you know, low political risk jurisdictions. Um, this is even despite the interest in sourcing critical minerals from these jurisdictions. Even for those projects that do make it to production, um, often those are faced with further cost hurdles. Um, this is because often the uh, mining may be uh, in an ore deposit that's previously been mined out. And so in those circumstances, not only can the grade of extracted minerals be lower, uh, but the extraction process cannot cost more, can use more energy, increase the costs of waste treatment and disposal, for instance, because low grade ore can create larger waste and tailings, and it can also create higher greenhouse gas emissions. Again, all of these, uh, these those factors, including responding to um, the greenhouse gas emissions, and et cetera, and increased tailings will actually drive up the production costs. Um, one other factor of limited supply is that often these deposits are uh, located in remote regions that don't yet have infrastructure in place to access them, or there are otherwise areas that are just difficult to mine. For instance, in Quebec, Canada, there's some large underground lithium deposits that are just not easy to mine due to the fact that they're hard rock located on the site. Another factor is with this increase in demand is that there's also been increasing prices. There's rapid and unpredictable price changes that can have an impact on both the ability of governments and corporations to adequately budget for the supply chain as a supply of critical minerals that they're needing. For instance, in 2021, lithium and cobalt prices increased by more than 100% and copper, nickel and aluminum by approximately 25 to 40% in the same period. We are continuing to see these rises into 2022 with one example where the price of lithium has been rising by 2.5x and nickel prices actually increased by 4x on one day in March of 2022 of this year, it was not actually a result of, uh, of economic financial factors, but was actually as a result of a short squeeze involving a major stainless steel producer. Another factor contributing to risks is that a lot of the uh, lithium deposits are concentrated within a small group of countries. With high concentration, risks of disruption can also increase, and the impact of any of those disruptions could then have a wide ranging global impact. Um, one example, for instance, is the concentration of production of rare earth elements. And as discussed, these are critical minerals in, the, in Canada and the United States. Uh, in 2019 alone, China supplied the United States and EU with 80% and 98% approximately, respectively, of their rare earth elements supply. Um, with implementation of China's COVID zero policy, there continue to be widespread shutdowns um, in the uh, production facilities in China and in, within mines and processing plants, each of which has the potential to disrupt the supply of these minerals. Um, another uh, concern which was touched on by Robin earlier is the uh, high use of water in Chile for the lithium production. Um, these concerns have actually sparked protests, uh, local pro community protests over the amount of groundwater consumed. And as Robin mentioned, uh, in response, mining companies are needing to implement uh, infrastructure to make use of seawater uh, instead of the groundwater. And this itself may further drive up production costs. So with all of these risks in mind, what is it that governments can do to actually mitigate risks to help uh, create a better, uh, better supply and more stable supply of, of their critical minerals? Well, there, we've seen efforts uh, across the board um, that range from multilateral, bilateral, and domestic strategic plans that are all aimed at, at helping control risks of shortages and supply disruptions for critical minerals. Um, one international, uh, oh, sorry, if we can, yep. Thank you. Go on to that one. That was great. Um, um, one of the such uh, initiatives is the Mineral Security Partnership, um, and that is a, a country partnership involved with the U.S., Australia, Canada, Finland, France, Germany, Japan, Korea, Sweden, United Kingdom, and the European Union. The goal with this initiative is to, quote, ensure critical minerals are produced, processed and recycled in a manner that supports the ability of countries to realize full economic benefit of their geological endowments. 
And in particular, the plan focuses on the minerals that are critical to production of electric vehicles and advanced batteries. The initiative also aims to promote investment um, by government and private sectors in critical minerals projects, including those in developing countries, provided that these, uh, government, these projects are actually adhering to high uh, ESG environmental, social and governance standards as, as promoting those standards is part and parcel with uh, the plan of investing in developing countries. There's actually most recently a uh, meeting in September of 2022 at the UN General Assembly where they invited developing nations such as Argentina and Brazil, among others, to discuss this direct investment into developing projects. Um, another example is the Critical Minerals Mapping Initiative, which is an initiative brought up together by US, Canada and Australia. Um, this mapping initiative is actually uh, intended to increase understanding about known critical resources and um, is focused uh, significantly on data collection as a way to increase supply of critical minerals. Um, one way that they're trying to accomplish this is by collecting data and mapping concentration of critical minerals in approximately 60 different countries. Um, you can actually uh, gain access to the interactive map that they have developed, um, whereby you can actually click and, and click throughout the concentration um, and view the map and the 60 different countries that have been included on there. Um, some other objectives include promoting understanding of science of critical minerals, sharing data, and creating a unified analysis of critical minerals. In addition to multilateral collaborations, we're also seeing bilateral arrangements with key partners and allies, such as the strategic partnership on raw uh, materials between Canada and Europe, and if we can just switch to the next slide on there, please. Perfect, thank you. Um, so this is a bilateral partnership between Canada and Europe, and this focuses on enhancing security and sustainability of trade and investment, integrating raw value change, raw material value change, and leading by example on environmental, social, and governance standards. Um, the plan has actually created a, a number of deliverables for itself, um, which it's interesting with a lot of these action plans to, to, you know, they haven't been in place for very long. It will be very interesting for all of these to see a sort of audit or report on um, how successful these deliverables were and how successful the initiatives were in obtaining their goals. Um, but some of the deliverables for this partnership include developing raw material projects in both regions, aligning financial support, incentivizing innovation for obtaining critical minerals from waste product, um, and advancement of best practices, along with a, a joint tracing zero, net zero battery minerals event to support research and innovation. And if you can go to the next slide, please. The other one to just briefly mention is the joint action plan between Canada and the United States that focuses on supply chains of critical minerals needed in strategic manufacturing sectors that includes communications technology, aerospace, defense, and clean energy. The action plan initiatives include research and development cooperation, supply chain modeling, and increased support for industry. The aim is to guide the cooperation and industry engagement, innovation, defense, and information sharing on mineral resources, as well as promote collaborative initiatives in research and development and supply chain modeling. We can just go to the next one, please. I'll uh, just quickly talk about this one. This is a sort of initial discussions that are happening right now between the United States Department of Defense um, and uh, the government on Ontario. And this has to do with potentially investing uh, directly into the so certain projects in um, Ontario, uh, one of which is no located in, uh, in a nor northern Ontario region referred to as the Ring of Fire. Um, this is seen as evidence of Biden's administration seeking to reduce its reliance on China for metals required for defense equipment and electric vehicles. Um, also, since the development of new mineral projects in Canada is very capital intensive, it's hopeful that these investments from and partnerships with the United States may help increase feasibility of North American projects and help establish the importance of North America itself as a supplier of critical minerals. Next slide, please. Uh, just talking about uh, national policies so, or domestic policies. Um, in Canada, we have, uh, we've seen uh, emphasis on this through the uh, control over foreign investment. Canadian government has the authority to control foreign investment in Canadian critical mineral projects through the use of the Investment Canada Act. Um, 
the act actually provides a review of significant investments in Canada by non-Canadians um, to ensure that they're in a manner that uh, would encourage investment, economic growth and employment, um, but to provide a review uh, to ensure that those investments are not injurious to national security and are of net benefit to Canada. So this act requires review of uh, any, uh, re either review or notification for establishment of new Canadian businesses or an acquisition of a Canadian business by a non-Canadian. Um, investments are then subject to a net benefit of Canada review or a national security review. And we, it's what particular importance to this presentation is that one factor considering during this review is the potential impact of the investment on critical minerals and critical mineral supply chain. In fact, um, the government has used this power to uh, block planned mergers and acquisitions involving non-Canadian if they're determined to not be of a benefit to Canada or a risk to national security. And just recently on October 28, 2022, the Canadian government announced a new policy regarding foreign investments from state-owned enterprises in critical minerals under the Investment Canada Act. Um, this policy provides further guidance on how applications for foreign investments in Canadian critical mineral projects will be reviewed. Um, it's actually stated in the policy that applications for control of critical minerals businesses by foreign state-owned entities will only be approved on an exceptional basis. Even applications for a minority interest could be um, to be subject to a review and finding that the investment could be injurious to Canada's national security. Um, in as recently um, in, as sh I mean, shortly after actually the implementation of this policy um, in connection with critical minerals under the new policy, you can see a recent decision by the Canadian government in which three Chinese companies were actually ordered to divest their investments in Canadian lithium mining business. These investments were minority interests, so not even controlling interests and related to mining projects both in Canada and abroad, one of the mining companies uh, was involved in, had mining operations out of Ontario, but the other two Canadian companies didn't even have mining operations in Canada, but were instead in Canada, in Chile and Argentina. Um, just quickly moving on to the next one. Next slide. Uh, you see some local and domestic efforts in the United States as well. One recent one is the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which is remarked as being the single largest investment in climate and energy in American history. Um, it supports uh, involving involve, sports involve processing, manufacturing, and recycling of critical minerals. Um, it also has implemented efforts to secure domestic supply of critical minerals. Um, for instance, there was an investment in defense's industrial base and analysis of $35 million for processing of heavy rare earth elements in Mount Pass, California. That's intended to provide more domestic control over the supply chain. Um, there's also steps to reform the mining law of 1872 uh, with fundamentals of uh, ESG standards in mind. And as previously mentioned by Robin, the critical minerals list was reviewed this year and updated um, and now contains some additional minerals that were not previously provided. Um, there's also been efforts to increase critical mineral stockpiling in the U.S., uh, such as through a memorandum of agreement signed by the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, and Department of State. Um, coordination of the stockpiling is expected to be implemented by increased local content rules as well. So on the next slide, there. I'm um, just heading to the summary here. The uh, I've covered a lot of the topic here, but the global supply chain in minerals and metals is obviously affected by many factors, uh, including staffing shortages due to COVID-19, Russia-Ukraine war, extreme weather events, and political instability. Minerals, critical minerals, are expected to continue to be a key area of focus in the mining industry due to their importance to clean energy technologies, national economies, and national securities. And as we discussed, this uh, supply is exposed to many risks um, that we discussed earlier. And in response to those risks, governments are developing critical mineral strategies um, that include collaboration with friendly nations, developing local supply and information gathering to determine new sources of supply. And that concludes our presentation. Now we will pass it over to our colleagues. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank
Thank you. In the next few minutes, James and I will discuss supply chain issues from risk management perspective. Next slide, please. In brief, to set the stage for our discussion, we've set out a few, a few areas of key risk on the slide in front of you. And as you can see, the areas of potential risk are far reaching and there can be risk coming from any number of areas. We will discuss political and regulatory risk in a bit greater detail later on. It's fairly evident what that entails. It's also possible for there to be um, risk where ESG intersects with one's supply chain. And this can include potential disputes with third parties, group or class actions from citizens, or claims under local tort and statute, along with NGO claims and activist shareholder claims. One interesting area uh, as this uh, uh, area further develops is in contractual disputes. And uh, primarily, uh, this is where there are a number of um, uh, more novel uh, clauses being drafted into contracts with respect to sustainability commitments or anti-discrimination commitments, along with the general issues around representations and warranties that one might be more used to. Uh, there are also an increase uh, that we're seeing in indemnity claims with respect to environmental performance and incidents. And uh, commitments to net zero goals are also uh, trying to be enshrined in contractual provisions, which leads to the question of, of what would happen uh, if uh, one were to find that that was being breached. And then, of course, post M&A disputes where those um, arise as a result of uh, ESG issues. Um, it's also possible for there to be claims under supply supply contracts in this area or with uh, other entities upstream or downstream in one supply chain. And we are seeing those start to take off. So if we can move to the next slide, please. To dive a bit more into that topic of ESG liability, I'll turn the microphone over shortly to James to discuss the last three points on the slide here in more detail. But we did want to mention for the sake of completeness, that liability with respect to ESG issues can be very much engaged when it comes to securities disclosure and other reporting requirements on companies. Um, this is an area that most of you are no doubt familiar with, uh, and it involves matters of alleged false reporting or misrepresentations and mandatory disclosures of material information as jurisdictions around the world are starting to bolster their requirements in that area. This can even include disclosures on composition of boards of directors or on senior management. And as I mentioned before on contractual cl uh, claims, there is an increasing number um, of companies with global operations that are looking for assurances on environmental, social and governance practices. Um, this could include uh, disputes with um, suppliers if you were to find out that they were in breach of specific reps or warranties on um, social commitments or on uh, environmental footprint commitments. In addition to the typical claims uh, that we're used to where there is an environmental incident uh, or something that um, that occurs during the course of operations. And James, I'll turn this over to you now to dive into the fun area of greenwashing and uh, what we're seeing on human rights, modern slavery and child labor. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so in terms of greenwashing, this is something that we're seeing a lot of. You're, you'll be familiar with it in North America. We're certainly seeing it in the UK and Australia. Um, and those claims are focusing on the public statements that are made um, by companies, including mining companies, as to net zero commitments. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And particularly, one thinks of coal mining companies. You know, that's going to be is going to be very difficult for them going forward. Um, and you know, it's interesting. I think the dynamic between greenwashing claims and the disclosure regimes that Rachel has made, because of course, companies are being encouraged to put information out there and make public commitments in terms of net zero. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, there are mandatory rules around that. But at the same time, in so doing, they are opening themselves up to, to greenwashing claims. And in fact, what we're now seeing is the flip side of that, which is green hushing. And so companies, as far as they can, not making those those um, disclosures. But as I say, you know, under the rele relevant regimes, that's not going to be an option going forward. In terms of directors' duties, um, I, I understand DNO premiums are going up. That's not um, surprising because we are now seeing claims against directors um, uh, arising out of, you know, often statutory duties to take into account the long-term consequences 
of the decisions they make and the impact on the community and the environment. And certainly in the UK, and I'm sure there are equivalent regimes globally, we're seeing derivative claims. So NGOs, activist shareholders, acquiring shares in listed companies, specifically for the purposes of bringing a derivative action on behalf of the company against, um, against the directors. So that's an, an area to watch um, and to be really mindful of. And then in terms of human rights um, encompassing modern slavery, child labour, that's clearly been a, a really big area in the mining um, sector for, for a, a long time now. Um, and there are all sorts of claims that that gives rise to. There are going to be NGO claims, there are regulatory claims, uh, and also government claims. Um, and of course, particularly in some of the jurisdictions that we've heard about, you know, that's going to be something that um, is a real concern and we'll, we'll return to that later on. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please, um, because the next thing I'd like to move to is, is parent company liability. Um, again, I think there are in, uh, multiple jurisdictions where we're seeing this, certainly in the UK, what we're seeing, and, and an example of this would be the Lungaway uh, Vedanta case, we're seeing UK listed or incorporated companies being used as an anchor defendant um, to fix liability for operations overseas. So in that case, it's it's in Zambia. Um, and as part of that litigation, the um, subsidiary is brought into the action, even though that's a foreign incorporated company. And that is, um, I think, something that is is we have to be really mindful of. Um, it's They are essentially class group actions that we're talking about. Um, in that particular case, 1,800 citizens. There are other claims where we're talking about hundreds of thousands of claimants. Um, and the nature of those claims is is negligence or breach of statutory duties, um, duty of care for what for, for um, actions overseas, often environmental um, or, or um, other you know toxic emissions that are put into the local community, um, and that is is clearly um, an area of of, of really high risk. Um, now those claims depend on a degree of control within the corporate group. Um, they they depend on on showing that the parent company exercises a degree of control or involvement in the management of the subsidiaries, and of course um, this is this is something we we're going to talk a bit a bit more about in a moment in terms of risk mitigation. But you know again we have a tension here, don't we, between um, the kind of control that you would want to be exercising over your supply chain. Um, and the, the potential risks that that gives rise to in terms of parent company liability um, and other and other risks. So you know it it, it is a, this is a difficult balance to to strike. Um, we 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 appreciate that. Um, so I think given the timing, should we move to risk mitigation, Rachel? Sure. We'll just I'll just mention quickly for those um, who are who are based in Canada, which I I think are a number of our audience. That uh, we heard from Melissa and Mel how the, the supply chain issues were on the radar and very much on the radar at COP27. And, and James has mentioned this concept of an anchor defendant. There is a, that we're see, that he's seen in the UK. There is in Canada a fairly recent case law that has found that a claim for alleged breaches of Canadian tort law and customary international law with respect to actions by contractors hired by a joint venture partner internationally can proceed against the Canadian parent company in Canadian court. So that parent company liability aspect is um, is very much alive and well. Now, uh, in that case, the Canadian parent company was the majority owner in the international joint venture. It was the minority local-based counterparty to the joint venture that was engaging the EPC contractors who engaged the subcontractors who allegedly engaged in the forced conscription work at the mine. And those individuals subject to that alleged work brought the lawsuit in Canada against the Canadian parent company directly. Now, whether those claims would have ultimately been successful remains to be seen. Um, shortly after the Supreme Court of Canada decision allowing the claims to proceed, the matter settled. But it leaves open that very real question on whether that Canadian company would ultimately um, have potentially been found liable for those actions. And in light of certain statutes that are on the horizon on forced labor, and on child labor and supply chains, this is very much going to be a live issue uh, going into next year in the future. I think we can go to the next slide then. James, do you want to dive in on contractual protections? Um, so, I mean, I think I think you've mentioned an, a number of those. Um, 
and I mean one one area that we can pick up here is is for example stabilization clauses if we're talking about political risk um, you know that's that's something that um, we see as an additional level of contractual protection in terms of, of actions that may be taken by the government and stabilization clauses seek to seek to fix um, the the regulatory and, and legal framework at the point of the investment um, uh, quite not always possible, of course, to negotiate those with um, with the government, and often governments will want to narrow those um, um, uh, as much as they can. Um, and you know, given some of the things that we've been talking about, one can expect carve outs relating to environmental and human rights legislation. Um, in terms of due diligence, this goes to the question of human rights issues in the supply chain. Um, I don't think we've got time to say much about it, but you will. Um, be familiar with much of the guidance around this. One thing I would recommend is the OECD due diligence guidance for responsible supply chains of minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. And that has, you know, a lot of um, a, a lot of guidance as to what you can do in this area. Um, really, it is about understanding the supply chain, making sure that sure that there are policies um, in place and training um, and making sure that you're doing risk management um, assessments and have plans in place. And, and that, it seems to me, is is um, the best thing that you can do um, as far as possible to pick up these issues in the supply chains. And, and um, although, you know, it goes back to this question of control. Ultimately, the best way of mitigating these risks is to make sure that the issues that give rise to liability um, never happen in the first place. Um, Rachel, did you want to say something on dispute resolution provisions? Sure. Um, perhaps just briefly, for those who uh, don't do this as a matter of practice, one thing to consider on those contractual agreements where you're working up and down your supply chain and where ESG issues might might come into play and, and you, you, you might be facing claims in that arena is to consider international arbitration for um, your dispute resolution provision for the entirety of that agreement or, or for some of it. Because these types of issues, if they were brought to the fore, um, like any dispute, could be costly and time consuming uh, to deal with in courts. But they also have the potential to have um, large uh, PR consequences and, and ramifications, depending on what the issue is. So alongside confidentiality provisions, using international arbitration might help to um, contain those disputes so that you have greater control over the messaging. And of course, by doing so, you can then work in a neutral forum and um, get a skilled tribunal when you're looking at novel and complex contractual provisions and issues. Uh, next slide, please. James mentioned stabilization clauses, and those are uh, such a useful tool to have in your tool chest. Another uh, one that pairs nicely is investment structuring, and this is, uh, we mentioned political and regulatory risk at the outset. Investment structuring at a very high level is structuring one's investment internationally in a way that it is protected by an international investment treaty, so that if a state or government breaches a protection in that treaty, the investment may bring a claim directly in international arbitration for its resulting losses. Um, I won't go into all of the protections under those treaties in the interest of time, but having access to that dispute resolution process when you're looking at a regulatory expropriation or a change, um, revocation of permits, change in environmental zoning that impact uh, your investment can also be an important tool. And that can uh, help uh, get you to the negotiation table if need be, or help you to chase that claim through uh, if you are financially impacted as a result. Um, James, I'll, I'll turn the microphone over to you, I guess, for closing comments on investment protections. Yeah, um, just to pick up one point in terms of counterclaims. Um, so, you know, we've talked about um, issues in the supply chain um, and, you know, impacts on local communities. We are seeing a number of cases now where, um, although historically ev everyone had thought the treaty claims were about investors suing states, we're seeing states bringing counterclaims in relation to impacts on local communities. You might be familiar with the Bear Creek um, case against Peru. Um, there are many other there are many other cases, and I think, um, or you know, and, and obviously it depends if the if the treaty permits those. Um, but the, really, I think the core takeaway from that is, you know, 
the reason to be doing all of these things in the context of a treaty claim is to make sure that if you're successful if you're successful in your treaty claim you're not met with a counterclaim that reduces your damages um, by a significant amount and so that's something to bear in to bear in mind um so i think we're a bit over um uh, robin but um turning back to you um in case we've got any q a questions yeah, thanks so much, James. I'm just waiting to get my video started here. It looks like we're pretty close to time, um, and I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A, but, but if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the panelists directly, and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, thanks so much for joining, and I'm going to just pass it over to uh, Melissa for the, um, for the closing remarks. Um, I think that we've run the gamut uh, from you know the the environmental the situation with supply chains and mining and the environment ESG um, and from also including risk and um, this group of people has such a depth of experience please do take advantage of the experience by contact any of us if you have questions and as robin said this is recorded and and you can get a copy of that as well um thank you all so much for attending it's 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 been a real pleasure have a good rest of the day <laughs>